Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the very latest edition of Pull the Pin. Yes, we are back. Business brand and banter at its very best. A little bit of shite thrown in. And today, we are not pulling the pin. All will become clear, probably. What can I say about today's guest? He's a bit of a potty mouth. In fact, you might say he's a bleep, bleep, massive bleep controversial bleep even a mother bleep he's the best-selling author of not a diet book and not a life coach in fact he sold so many books that jeff bezos has been able to retire early it's only james bleep smith do you want to introduce yourself because mine was shit <laughs> uh no just thanks for having me on we've not done anything yet oh no just being polite i've still got doms from being shown around your house <laughs> So James can't wait to talk to you about all things uh, fitness related. We actually came prepared as well because we've got this. So we've got the, not the swear jar, we've got the swear bucket, which is not my helicopter fund. Despite what I think, we've got it, we've got it, there's a pound in there as well. So we've even got you started. So feel free to contribute. I want to put that down there. So every time you swear, then pound's got to go in there. Can I put grenade chairs in there? Uh, yeah, anything like that, any any old junk, just chuck it in there. Uh, so look, thanks so much for doing this. I know you're mega busy, so we've uh, we wanted this for a while. But look, take us back. You're one of the best known faces, I hate to say, in the fitness industry globally. How did it all start? How did you end up in Australia smuggling budgies? Um, I think that for the first few years of being a personal trainer, just did a very normal job of personal training, and I just saw social media as like a interest savings account. Now. I'm not really interested in traditional savings methods of, oh, you know, you need to buy a house, you need to get a mortgage, where most of my friends bought houses in areas they didn't want to live with people they didn't really love. And I was like, I'm not doing that. What I'll do is... I'll Although post- you hang around with dinner a lot, so... <laughs> yeah. But like, it, you know what everyone does, they, they grow up, they get to 22, 23, they're like, oh, I need to be smart, I need to invest. But for me, I was like, I'm going to put two posts today on social media relevant to what my clients would need. So if a client asked me a question in the gym, I'd be like, hold on, I'm going to write that down. And I'm going to make a post of it later. Because if they're asking that as a client, there's going to be 10 other prospects out there that are thinking the same thing. And for me, I was thinking if I do this for 10 years, I'll be able to self-publish a book and a few thousand people will buy it. And really, I was just hugely ahead of schedule. Four years in. Was that because Luke wrote it for you at the end? Was that how you ended up getting on track? I actually wrote my own book, so not to rip all the other authors. Yeah, yes, in the UK. I, yeah, I don't want to get, yeah, not what Luke says, but never mind. Yeah, we'll carry on. We'll sort that out later. The lawyers right. will sort that one out in a few years' time. Be like you, the social network. Are you writing a book at the moment? Uh, no, I'm not. I am, I am. I'm reading a proper book though as well. Actually, I'm reading this one at the minute. This is a. This is a. Look at this. This, this is this is a classic. And you'll see again. We've got. So if, if you're not watching this on YouTube, and you should be, I've got Paula Lima's book, Fit. I mean, we're on the front. It's a classic. That is best fitness book in the industry, without a shadow of a doubt. Is it because it's got the grenade icon yes. in the background? No, 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 not at all. No, I've got your book as well. It's literally propping up. It's propping up my the chair here. So these are super comfy. I find I've got these everywhere. So we find wonky table, you know, bit of back support, anything. These are great. Got ten of these around the house. Can be very handy. But no, no, t- I'm not writing a book to answer the question. Do you think I should? Uh, Should maybe, I get Luke to do it for me? No, I was thinking more like, you know, uh, when it comes to branding, to come up with such original, fantastic ideas for supplement companies. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he's been sarcastic or not now. I've got another yeah. one for you. We call it gun or rifle. And then we could we get something else and just maybe I've, call it like tank. I've, I've got a rifle collection. Would you like to see it later? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's not a euphemism. Um, but say, so, okay, sorry, go back then. So you, yeah, so you had a schedule. How did you end up in Oz? What made you leave the UK and, and, and go over there? <laughs> interesting enough, I was, <laughs> I was at a festival. Is it interesting? Yeah. We'll be the I judge was, of that. But. I was in Croatia and uh, I participated in the recreational use of an illegal substance. And I had a bit of an out-of-body experience. And I came back around to my mates and I said, I'm, I'm moving to Oz. Was it they, one of our bars? Because sometimes you went out of date when it does that to people. <laughs> my mates at the time, because I had, I had no uh, preconceived ideas of ever going to Australia. Literally within half an hour, I went from never wanting to go to, I had this introspective conversation myself. I said, I'm moving to Oz. And six weeks later, I was gone. And my dad was having, me and my dad were having a barbecue outside. And you know, like, you sometimes say to people, you want them to push back and shut your ideas down. It's like, so, uh, dad, I'm thinking of maybe going to Oz. 
And I was expecting him to be like, no son, you've got a good business, you know, families at home, it's a long way away. He goes, yeah, I've always, I've always seen. I've always wanted you to go to Australia, yeah, yeah. fuck off, yeah. He's like, I've always oh, imagined you in place like in there, no. So yeah, went and uh, just went one way, um, took a backpack. I literally had like a North Face holder, it's all I took with me. And I went via Bali, flew into Cairns, worked my way down. And when I got to Sydney, I was like, this is the place. And do you think that's played a part in the success or do you think it's irrelevant? Do you think you could have done this from anywhere? Because there's something about being in Australia, the weather's better, there's more there's more leisure there. People, I think, embrace the outside lifestyle a bit more than we do here. I thought that would be the case, but it was more that when I went over there, I went with about £3,000. That was it. That's all I had to my name. Uh, I had a car. And was that a week to last year? Was that <laughs> the allowance? £3,000 in my account, that was it. I like lived spending all my money when I was a PT because I had so much coming in. I'd just make sure I spent it all. And I had a great time before I went to Australia. But when I was there, it was kind of that notion that if I run out of money, I need to go home. So it was almost like a gun to the back of my head where I was like, if I don't turn up today, if I don't do these posts, if I don't cultivate my business to get new people on board to fund this amazing time in my life, I'm going home. And when I got to Sydney, I had to uh, fly home. I sold my car in finance and I'd only had it a year. So I ended up losing a thousand pounds I didn't have to sell my car so I could go back to Australia. And when I'm sitting on an air flight, air China flight. We flew Air China, nice. 10 hour stop off in Beijing, right? I had a Chinese guy falling asleep on me while I was watching Saving Private Ryan in Chinese for the second time. It's probably better, if anything. I get to Beijing airport and there's no, no social media, no Gmail, nothing, no internet, because you, you can't get onto anything. Yeah. And my laptop was so rubbish at the time, I had to plug it in to use it. If I took it out, it'd last four seconds and the battery would die. So when I get there, I realise I can't go to Netflix. I can't it's like, go online. It's like Duran having sex. It's like Mate. four seconds and then that's it. So imagine this, so right? told. I'm, I'm sat on the floor in Beijing airport, which is freezing. I'm making my way back to Australia. I've got about £52 in my bank account. And I can't even write emails to get sales, to get paid. I've literally just got 30 hours of travel ahead of me. And I look through my laptop. And I remember a couple of years before, I'd like taken a USB drive and copied some films. Sorry, to copyright whoever is going to come after me soon. <laughs> and um, I looked through all those films and only one of them had actually remained on the drive and it was Dallas Buyers Club. Everyone has said it was such an amazing film and it was the only one I had left. I hadn't watched it. So I've got a 10 hour stop off. I've now got seven and a half hours because I've watched the film, but now I'm worried I've got AIDS. So I'm sat in Beijing on the floor, worried I've got AIDS because that film is not good, by the way. It just makes you very, very paranoid. And I'm sat there thinking, wow, this is my life. And when I got to Sydney, after another 10 hour flight, watching movies in Chinese, I was like, I need to make something of myself or I'm moving back in with my mum and dad. Cause that was my only option. Yeah, That was it. So when I got to Australia and I got off the plane, made sure I had my STD test cause I did not like that film. And then <laughs> I got on about life in Australia, got on about life in Sydney. You can have one at the end of today as well, by the way, we'll include that. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. And like, it was like a self perpetuating cycle of, do I like my life? Yes, I love it. This is the best version of my life I've ever had. Do I want this to continue? Yes, I must be tenacious, audacious and persistent with absolutely everything I do or this is going to come away. And I think that a lot of people, it's kind of when they end up in these back to the wall situations that they see the best version of themselves. And it's kind of unfortunate that so many people go through life without ever being under financial pressure, without being under, you know, any type of stress. We almost breed future generations to be soft. I'll make sure you've always got savings. I'll make sure you do the nine to five that you don't like because you never know the economy might take a downturn. And it just breeds soft people because ultimately the best comes from people when they're dropped from a team, when they something goes wrong, when the business goes under. Failure, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Do you mind me asking, are you inherently quite lazy, would you say? The reason I ask that is because I'm quite lazy and people find that really hard to believe, but I like the fire under me. And you mentioned about the fact you like having that bit of pressure, putting yourself under pressure, because that's when you probably perform your best. Because if that pressure wasn't there, would you, you know, would, would you just do nothing? No. And I think that doing nothing, or at least doing nothing exciting, is a huge contributor to people that are malaise and their poor mental health. Because I think that there's no sitting at neutral for mental health. I don't think you can sit at zero where it goes minus 10 and plus 10. Okay. I feel like you always have to be in the plus. And if you sit someone in a room that does nothing, I don't think that's healthy for the mind or the brain. No, I agree. So, but I, I, it's just, I, you know, I'm one of those people, again, I just like being, having that fire under me. Like, I, you know, just like you said, having no money, spending I, that money and then having... I think so too many people misinterpret that fire. They misinterpret that and they see it as fear. They don't use it as a motivator. 
I think that people can have their wires crossed in the sense that they don't see a bad situation as a motivator for doing better, for improving, for getting up, for going. I always say to myself that if my complete brand collapse and I'm skin, I'm no, I'm opening a jujitsu gym and I'll knock on a hundred doors a day yeah, during yeah, the yeah. hours that I'm not doing classes and I'll build a business out of it. People don't see that. They, they sit at home and they kind of feel sorry for themselves, feel sorry for the times. They misinterpret that, that, that situation and use it for an excuse to be a pity party. Not everyone, but yeah. a lot of people. I think definitely that tenacity is something that, again, it's interesting about having sort of a potentially breeding a softer generation now, because that tenacity, I think, is something that's just potentially been lost in few, you know, in previous generations. Because, again, you know, I was thought, again, if, if I hadn't, again, if my back was absolutely up against it, I'd go and, and people might think it sounds bonkers, but, you know, I'd go and dig holes in the ground for a tenner a day. You, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tenner that you didn't have you got something to show for it you know as opposed to sitting around waiting for something to happen go and make something happen yeah no i think that people worry they have so much anxiety about the future and i always say to them like if bad things happen and you end up in a worse position than you are now you're probably going to get out of bed earlier and work harder yeah like that's probably what's going to happen no one no one's puts faith in and this was i know it's cheesy because it's from the book no one puts faith in the future version of themselves most people have never let themselves down never they, I say, oh, okay, in the last 10 years, when did you really fuck up? They go, well, I haven't. Well, why do you think you're going to in the next 10 years? If you if you have your back so far in your life, take risks, do shit, spend your money, go away, m pursue a business idea, however crazy it is. Because ultimately, you've never let yourself down. And if you've got a track record of that, why the fuck are people so scared to take a risk in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, again, this comes up a lot. We've, we've chatted about this a lot in the podcast in the sense that people say, oh, I would love this one day, but I'll just wait a year, I'll wait two years, I'll wait three years. Think, actually, what's wrong with doing it now? Because I, I guarantee you, anyone you speak to that's ever, you know, potentially been successful, built a business, they'll always wish they'd done it sooner. I wish I'd started my businesses sooner. I mean, I, and I was actually, I was 32 when I started Grenade. But, you know... And actually, if you start it younger, you've got longer to recover if it doesn't work. I think it's probably a very good idea to potentially start a new business venture when you're 70 because you're not going to recover from it and you've got sort of less responsibilities when you're younger as well. I think they say that if you don't regret when you started your business, you did it too late. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, what you said. That actually sounds a lot better. Right, so now, your book. Now, I've not read your book, right, but my people have. <sighs> My people, I mean, no, yeah, no, but I've, I've read highlights. I have read highlights, but I've learned we both use a pregnancy pillow. It's, and do you know what? Are they the best thing ever invented or what? Uh, what I'd like to do, and again, the feminists won't be happy. Let's take that away from pregnant women. You can't, oh, yeah. you can't own that pillow to be yours. That I've is got a, two. This is an ergonomically shaped pillow that suits both genders. Or all 70 genders, right? <laughs> yeah, 132 <laughs> genders. From the ergonomics of side sleepers with the way the pelvis and the upper back and all this works, like let's not reserve the rights to this pillow to be only for pregnant women. Like pregnant women, by all means, use this ergonomic pillow. We should probably go into business, make up a new name for it. Definitely. Branding, take it to the market. If you don't have the best sleep of your life, your money back. I've already, I can already I, see the dollar They signs. are the best thing ever. I actually worry now, if I go and stay in a hotel... I feel like I want to take my pregnancy pillow with me, which is a bit weird. In fact, have you bought it today? Because you're staying there, have you got... I didn't. I'd, I'd heard good things about the house. Um, to see only one pillow on each side of the, of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Even it's, in... the fact, it's the fact you're sharing in the smallest... You want to share with Dirham, which is slightly weird. You could have your own room, but you'd rather be with Dirham in the smallest room. But that's fine, whatever floats your boat. Well, the thing is, you know, you've got to, to maximise your time on social media. And for Dirham and I, I'm sure there'll be a time that we come off it. But until then, we've just got to keep the gravy train going and sharing a room is going to help that tonight. I, I, will, I will try and get you a spare pregnancy pillow for tonight. We'll get one from somewhere. Um, you said about coming off social media. Do you honestly think you ever would or you could? Um, yes, ultimately. Or maybe at least use it a lot less. So for the moment, it, it's a marketing machine and it's something you utilise to build your brand to get yourself to a certain point. I think like accelerating on a motorway, you're going to use the most petrol, get into the speed you want to get at. And then you cruise, you maintain that speed, but you don't need the same amount of petrol that you did before. And that's where the efficiency can come in because it is, it's very consuming and people go, you must get sick of it. And you don't because it's the backbone of your business, but there's going to come a time, for instance, Dieran and I don't have private accounts that we run off of our main accounts. And that should be indicative of why, where we're at with our heads. Like for us, it, it is important. It is building a brand. It does connect us with our, with our market. But there's no denying that it is consuming 
big amounts of time, energy, everything from it. And I think, especially if I was to have kids, then it would be right. These are my hours that I'm on. Then these are my hours that I'm not on because I would never want to be a parent that spent his whole time on his phone in front of a kid. I wouldn't want yeah you know, yeah yeah so like that that's ultimately the goal but then just get them into daycare get them into nursery dad wants to check tiktok fuck off you know because i must admit i hate social media you see again you're a different generation to me but it doesn't occur to me to film a lot of this stuff like you're you know straight there filming every little thing you know 50 stories a day but you you need to people are invested and in you know they they want to know what's going on it's like watching a daily vlog but they get to watch it in chunks and yeah, they yeah, can yeah. do three minutes in the morning four minutes in the evening and if you can captivate these audiences you know not only can you entertain them but then when it comes to you needing them hey my tickets are going on sale hey this is the event you've been asking me about on my story questions but not only that you can get a direct connection with your market or your you know it's market research ask me a question they are quite literally giving you trends in the market have you seen this what do you think of this what do you think of this if in my story questions, there are three topics, like the Laura Hubbard, transgender um, lady lifting in the Olympics. I was going to come on to that. So when I see that, I'm like, this needs to be addressed because they're quite literally giving me the market research I need to decide what is going to be on trend. And similarly to day one, when a client said, James, what is a carbohydrate? And I went away and did a post. If all these people are asking me the same topic, this needs to be addressed because- yeah. If 10 people are asking it, a thousand people are thinking it. Absolutely. And I tell you what, you, I love your analogies, just the way you simplify things, the analogies with money, the driving, the car. And it all feels like it's kind of common sense, but it isn't common sense if you don't know. And these analogies that you come up with are fantastic. So speaking of which, we'll come back to the, the transgender sport in a moment, but speaking of which, so Daily Mail Online yesterday, happened, so it must be true, happened to notice they did an article yesterday about eating chocolate for breakfast to lose weight. And then you said in response to that, that basically you can have dick for breakfast. All right, a quote. So now I've been doing that and I'm, I'm actually gaining weight, if anything. Um, so be honest, is it the dick? Uh, it'll it, probably it, be it'll probably well, the fact that you're not spitting afterwards. Well, it's Deeran's dick. <laughs> and I'm, so it's just not filling me up. So basically you talk a lot about deficit but I, can i go into dick deficit and then i know you like an acronym as well but i'm basically i'm in like a dick cycle doom loop okay yeah. cool so it's like a cycle of cock karma okay and basically yeah i'm wondering could it be addressed with with a different dick no i, d I don't think it's a different dick i think you, we just are you sure because i can't help but thinking if it was paula lima's dick it'd be more filming we need to more, more filling rather we, we just need to push this dick back to 1 p.m right we get okay. this dick back to 1 p.m autophagy can then, uh, you know, don't want to turn this into a science lesson, but pretty much, you know, we could push that back to 1 p.m. Anti-aging properties, you know, you probably live to 140, lose weight, build muscle, make your dick bigger. That's what everyone does with breakfast. You do that with dick, you are... Because, I mean, I don't want to be graphic about Paula Lemus, but it is a bit like a baby's arm holding an apple. It's like, so, but yeah, we'll we'll come, we'll, we'll touch on that. We'll, yeah, we won't dominate the podcast with, with Paul's dick, but yeah, that's really helpful. So hopefully that's clear that for everyone uh, uh, that was wondering the answer to that very question. Uh, right, speaking of, of dicks, uh, transgender women in sport. So again, you've got quite specific views on this. So tell us, what are your thoughts on that? Do they have an unfair advantage? Uh, and does it undermine previous achievements yeah, in sport by biological women? Absolutely. And if I was to bring a, a parallel into it, if you have a, a male who's taken anabolic steroids, then discontinued or done steroids in an off season, they're still going to get an advantage. And we've seen this in rugby for years where they're tested between nine months of the year. So they go on cycle when they're not in the season. And rugby players come back bigger and bigger and bigger. You look at the average weight of a rugby player now versus 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure the under 18s men's rugby team are now heavier than the World Cup winning side that we had in 2003. So would you say that a rugby team that are taking steroids in their off season have an unfair advantage? Do you? Oh, absolutely. So then what we're looking at then is testosterone manipulating the development of human body. So that's without bringing gender or sex into the equation. So then if you have someone who's got 35 years of living as a male, which are just so happen to be the 35 years of prime testosterone development even things like hip structure the hip the pelvis is very different in a man than it is mm -hmm. to a woman even when our bodies are identified uh like uh that have decomposed and they've just got the skeleton left 
people can see straight away that's a man, that's a woman, that's persons from Eastern Europe, that person's from Asia. We've got very different hip structures and there's no question about it that even testosterone-lowering agents won't change the physical structure of a body, nor we've got things like muscle memory. When people come off steroids, they can still get back to that previous amount of muscle a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we have that for a start. So as far as the physical unfair advantage, boom, that's it. And this is manipulated by science. We've got Casta Semenya, I believe, who's a, a female athlete who has extraordinary high testosterone. Oh, she was supposed to take uh, testosterone uh, to re lowering reducers. Agents. That's right, I remember. Okay. But I, I completely disagree with that having to be a thing because ultimately sports and competition and fighting, UFC, boxing, it's all about finding natural talent the, which are in the top echelons of sporting performance. Now, I don't like it when it's fitness people that are using it to then push branched chain amino acids. You're mm -hmm. like, hold on, mate. You know, you're a dreamy, you're a dreamy guy. Stop pushing shit supplements. You know, stop that. But like, you remember in the film Thor with Brad Pitt, where they sent their two best fighters out, and Brad Pitt goes up against that massive guy. I believe that kind of stuff happened back in the day. You'd have that one freak in the army who's like seven foot, like Anthony Joshua. You'd be like, send him forward, right? <laughs> So these people exist and they have for thousands of years. And this Casta Semenya, to me, she's one of those people who's in the top echelon. Let her perform, let her yep. win, yeah, yeah, yeah. let her go do her thing. So it's not just about hormone levels. We can't be taking bloods in this day and age and deciding that. But someone who has biologically been born as a male and decided to swap over. My main concern is, first of all, the 21-year-old Kiwi athlete who did not get to go to the Olympics because of this. Sonny Webster, one of our really good friends, seeing the emotion on his face when he qualified for the Olympics, when he was doing the British weightlifting open, like it gives me goosebumps even just thinking about it, how happy someone was qualifying to represent their country at the Olympics. To think someone's missed out on that because mm. someone else has decided to step in. Is it Laurel's complete fault? I don't think so. I think that she's probably played the system a bit, but it's the powers that be that are leaning and backward bending to remain relevant and in inclusive and all of these legislations that are coming in from the top level, it affects the athletes beneath them. And the athletes are the constituents of these events. The Olympics is nothing without their athletes. And, you know, I'm not saying that people uh, that are transgender are, you know, not, you know, there are going to be men out there that are mental. I'm telling you this now. As a man, that's not, you know, discriminatory at all. There are men out there that are crazy, that maybe never made it as an athlete in their life, but they're big, they're strong, they're competent, they're probably in the top 15 athletes, never made it to the Olympics. There's going to be a pool of men right now licking their lips at the opportunity of swapping genders, doing 12 months at lower testosterone and going into a women's division and lifting a medal. Guarantee it. Do you think it's really do that? I guarantee this will be the first domino. We'll watch the amount of people transitioning genders to go to the Olympics. If you've got nothing else on your mind than lifting gold at the Olympics and you don't mind how you get there. Yeah, it's, yeah. So what do we do? Do we wait till it's three, four, five people? And again, this could be controversial as well. When I made these points, people think I was transphobic, but I'm actually trying to be incredibly mindful of trans populations because at the moment, the way they are perceived in, in the current light is, hey man, hey woman, you want to do this? You want to swap around? That's great. Good you luck, do you? Yeah. yeah. But if this continues... And the next Olympics, it's 10 athletes. And the next Olympics, it's 20. The public's opinion of trans people and what they're doing to their own athletes, it's going to change the public perception. Yeah, of them. And I don't see that going in a positive position. So stepping in now and saying, let's, you know, not do this, I think benefits everyone. Do you think it, there could be like a trans category? That's exactly what I want to push for. Yeah, And, okay, okay. and you know, we've got the Paralympics where we're saying to people, hey, you know, you may not be fully able-bodied, We've made a whole whole category for you guys. You know, you can come together. You can create a community. And we, we as able-bodied people, are so proud to see that happen. And we could get behind uh, another category for, for trans athletes and say, hey, you know what, guys? <laughs> guys not speaking as in like yeah, no, yeah. You've got to be so careful, that. haven't you? Because you've got to be hey, every pe single hey, word. has got to be careful. gender transition out. populations, this category is for you. And I think they would get more support doing that than they would the current way they're going. Yeah, 100%, definitely. And you touched on sort of, you know, influencers and supplements and, you know, and I want to talk to you about authenticity and stuff as well because there's something I think definitely that we'll have in common, which is what I'd call fitness fakery. Just tell me your thoughts on fitness fakery, I'd call it. So, yeah, oh, I did this, I took that, I have this weight loss too. I mean, I thought 
probably a few years ago, oh, this will never take off. People can't be that gullible. They won't, you know, they won't sort of fall for that. But actually, it really worries me they do. What's what's the the pressure that's being created? I think that say you've got a female who diets down to a certain body fat percentage and suddenly she gets all these offers. Oh my God, you're looking great. We, we want to promote you for this, this. We've got active wear supplements, active wear supplements, cool. Bang, big brand comes in. We're going to give you £10,000 a month to represent and sell our clothing. Cool. £10,000 a month is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So when she wants to take her calories back up to baseline, when she wants to have a diet break, she's not just thinking about her physiology. She's thinking about a mortgage. She's thinking about her car payments. She's thinking about how she's going to afford to go on holiday to get the tan she needs for the next photo shoot. Suddenly, you've got someone who hasn't eaten above their diet and calories for a year. Then what? What, what are they doing with themselves? What, what do they think the implications of this going to be? Then suddenly we have an aspirational generation who see this person. When there's 10,000 pounds or more on the line to keep you lean, mm -hmm. you suppress that hunger. You develop eating disorders, which are most eating disorders that I know about exist within the fitness industry. Then we've got younger generations going, why can't I get that lean and stay that lean? Because they're just doing it recreationally. They haven't got huge amounts of money. It's not their mortgages. So you've got people that have got normal jobs, normal relationships with food and good physiques, but that's not enough for them because their favorite person or ambassador that they look up to is in better shape. And this just go around in circles and circles and circles and the amount of pressure that's being put on these athletes. I don't think that's fair for a start, but then to cover them in baby oil, get them to get a pump, Photoshop and edit them, put them onto it's social media. It's a good night out. Yeah. <laughs> it's, to me, it's, it's really worrying that the epitomization of physique is really cloak and daggers. And a lot of it is just pictures on Instagram. We went to Body Power, what, four years ago? They don't look like that in real life. We walked around. And keep in mind, they peak for Body Power. They, oh, they, I know. That was going to say people diet to walk around a show. <laughs> but the people that are being paid to get there, they go on cycle just to get there. And you could tell by the amount of acne that's kicking about when you get there. But I was like, huh, that's that fitness model. I was like, I've double tapped a lot of his pics and this is his prime condition. He's like five foot two. I thought this guy was like Arnie or The Rock. And you go around and you're like, no, no, no. When you see them in real life, they're nothing like what they look like on social yeah, media. Yeah, it's very, very deceptive seeing things through, uh, yeah, through a camera lens as such. And again, it worries me. We, I, I, was, I was chatting to... Um, uh, David Hay, funnily enough, on on Friday, and we were chatting about supplements and stuff, and he 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 had got completely the wrong idea about about grenade in the sense that he thought we got loads of non compliant products, and he couldn't believe that we were in form sport. And I just thought it got me thinking because I thought actually, how do we get across all the good stuff? Bearing in mind there's so much fitness fakery out there, it kind of then. It, it kind of hurts the brands that want to be honest and genuine that actually, you know, all of our stuff's like in formal sport and he got no idea. And I thought, actually, this guy's a sort of, you know, been a professional athlete. He should know this stuff. But again, it just worries me that the, the most important things don't get cut through on social media, but just that, you know, the way someone looks and sort of the bullshit that tends to get through. It's kind of like whoever shouts the loudest. Yeah, and, and I mean, there are legitimate products that I think can can help people. And that messaging that's getting across to them can be, sometimes skewed like let's take a protein bar for instance like that should be said to be it should be messaged to people hey this is a chocolate bar that tastes nice which is going to contribute towards one of your goals it's not a track and it's not a snack it's not a dessert it's not magic it's a chocolate bar we put protein in it so you can enjoy a hedonic snack and it will contribute to your overall goal for the day yet we've got these two leaning things one don't have them they're junk food the other side no protein's the most important thing like we've got these almost like two political parties everything's extremist at the moment you know politics you're either one or the yeah, other yeah everything's gone yeah and now definitely. even in fitness scene you're either one or the other and it makes it very difficult like you say to tread the line of having an honest uh discussion about what your product is without ending up in either camp yeah no without a shadow of a doubt and i mean so who do you think then now put you on the spot who do you think is the most irritating person in the fitness industry right now fitness you're not allowed to say Darren or oh, fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and also who's the biggest legend in the fitness industry you're not allowed to say no um should we start with the legend do you know what i, I love paul lima i know you got his book there yeah but do you know what? he's he's one of the most annoyingly positive people in the world i love paul like there was a time that i thought he was going through a bit of a rough patch so i went into london i was like paul let's hang out today and he's got this like little bed it looks like 
if there was like a, the end of the world tomorrow and they had to pop, pop up camps with those little like soldier beds, the little single ones with like the metal spring mattresses. He had one of them and I got around and I was like, you're right, mate. And he was so, he was, he was like, Jimbo, I'm great. He's like, I've got a food full of belly. I've got my beautiful daughter. I got everything. I was like, I was like, mate, you're a legend. And how he commands the room to make content. It's the funniest thing ever. He's always laughing. I, do you know what? I, I, I really believe in just surrounding myself with people I actually really like. Obviously, today's an exception. Um, but because if you can do that, just with people that you genuinely like, and Paul's one of those people where, you know, the first time he came here, we're, we're just within three seconds, for no reason, we're just laughing. I can't even tell you what we were laughing about, but we just we just started laughing. And all we did that day was just sort of laugh. And the more you get to know, you know, someone like Paul. It's infectious yeah, it's, as well. It's really infectious, definitely. And yeah, you're right. It does make you sort of think that, you know, anything's um, possible. And again, yeah, he's, he's, he's such a lovely guy. The shit he's done to me as well in this house. I mean, literally tied me up in the house. I've been dragged around. I mean, uh, unbelievable. He just comes in, doesn't ask, he just does it. Yeah. So he's just like, uh, all right, so today I, I, don't, I, I don't do as good a polyam impression as you do, but I do do a fairly good Irish accent. But I tell you what, I'm going to tie you up in the house and I'm going to pretend that you've, uh, yeah, we've got a home invasion, blah, 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 like that. But you do a better accent than me. So, but yeah, the stuff he's done, unbelievable. As far as the most annoying, um, I, I would just like to categorise everyone who, when lockdown started, pretended like life was great doing live home workouts. Hey guys, today we're going to be doing this little home workout. And I was like, Guys. Was that Joe Wicks? No, it was everyone. Oh, okay. Right. I, d I wouldn't know. I don't see any of his um, ever. And um, <laughs> thank God. And just everyone came together on Insta and just saw this opportunity to put this fake happiness across. Like when lockdown initially happened, it was shit. And I was like, guys, can we not just have a moment to appreciate it? life's shit right now? You know, doesn't mean we're depressed. It just means, you know, things are a bit shit. Everyone was like, don't worry that gyms are closed. Don't worry about it. We're going to work out at home. And I was like, this is so fake and false. It's like making my blood boil. So anyone, Dirino did it twice, so it's okay. But anyone who tried spending months just trying to do this fake stuff, and they're like, today, I was like, oh, you're exhausted. Especially for like a hotel room as well. So anyone that did like a fitness workout from a hotel room while they were quarantined in Australia. Just have two weeks off. Oh, like know, if you come out a little bit soft around the belly, you spend two weeks in a hotel, you've been quarantined, and you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And just counting the steps around the hotel room and stuff like I know, that. I mean, just, just, I'll give it, give oh, over. Oh, I know, give it yawn, yeah. Did you see oh, how skinny so, he was I'm, when he came out of quarantine? He snaked <laughs> me. <laughs> should, we bring, should we bring him in? I feel like, because we've given him shit the whole podcast. He's sat, Dieran's actually sat, come on. We've even got a little mic for you and everything. This is Kieran Dartel. <laughs> Hello. This is our 27th podcast. <laughs> You've done you've done really well to just sort of we, we've we've said you've got a small willy and everything we've and you've sat there perfectly. Before quietly. we begin, <laughs> oh look, sales have just gone up. And sales have gone up. Can I just say I did not ever do a live workout. Are they? Work I recorded myself working out. <laughs> it wasn't trying to get everyone to do a live workout. Good because they they didn't. People um, get defensive when you hit a nerve, don't they? No, no, no. But <laughs> I, I hear what James is saying about that. <laughs> But I think people got pissed off from what you said, innit? Yeah, I was like, yeah. But that was because they were like, what's this prick? No, he's in Australia. I'm surprised you didn't really enjoy lockdown. Was it? Was I did. It that, yeah, I enjoyed lockdown. I did. And I, just so what did you enjoy about it out of interest? It was the first time I never had FOMO. Like you're never worried I, about yeah, doing something. Okay. It was like everyone's kind of forced to do the same thing. So you're kind of pressured to focus on yourself, which is like the first time I actually did that, which was great. And I say I enjoyed it. It's like meant because again there was a lot of uncertainty, but mentally, I think it was fantastic. Because for the first time ever, certainly you know I've, I've kind of always been self-employed, so I mean, same yourself really. So you, you get up and you you work because you you have to. But for the first time ever, someone said actually don't go to work. Don't, I mean again we work from home, but you know it was like you didn't have the commute, you weren't going into the office. It was like it was a real reflection period for people just to kind of actually do something different. So I think it was actually almost like liberating to a certain extent. Three months would have been enough. Oh yeah, I'm talking about the first three weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. 18 months yeah. in, I'm like, hold on, it was two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah, I forget yeah, there were 27 cannot... lockdowns. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fair enough. I meant well, lockdown one, the original lockdown, yeah. not you, the sequel. Do you feel like you got more done at home though? Uh, I, I yeah. Definitely yeah, you it, did, right? It, it was just, again, I just think it was a real period for reflection and it yeah. just made you think what was probably important it was just nice not seeing cars on the road and i yeah. got ten thousand steps a day done going for a piss yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> no, 
uh, we're yeah. gonna get we're, we're gonna get lost in a late. I'll be honest. It, uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the worst place uh, for for lockdown here. But was it like in Australia there for you to during that lockdown? Because that sounds like you. We had, that was we kind had, of a shock. We had twelve weeks and then we came back to normality. Uh, however, Australia handled it so well they've completely fucked themselves because their their vaccine uptake is dreadful. They're not even vaccinated five percent. But can you blame them? Where in Queensland, for instance, I think there's been six COVID deaths since COVID began. Six deaths. So you've got a massive population of people and they're going, well, we don't need it. We don't want it. You know, the the remember what I said about gun to the back of the head makes you do stuff. Mm -hmm. Then in Australia, there's this notion where they live in a holiday destination. They're on an island. They've got tight immigration. They handled COVID well. They've got no motivators to take that forward step with vaccinations, with all of these things. And now they've really been shown up as almost every state's gone into lockdown because their vaccine uptake's been been so low. And you're 18 months into a pandemic. So I was there very much for the amazing period. We got dance floors back. Uh, you know, it, we, 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 got tour. To, yeah, we got to experience life. We had the tour. We had like 1,200 people in a room, no masks. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I've managed to come back to the UK and they've just gone into lockdown everywhere again. I, I said actually from the start that, I don't know if you agree with this, but the cure is worse than the disease. From what respect? Uh, well, just the sense that, uh, okay, we've got this very, very infectious illness, which, yeah, is is terrible. We've never seen anything like it before in terms of this global pandemic. But is it worth potentially crippling the next two or three generations? I, you know, the, uh, worth crippling the economy? I, I agree with, uh, the, I wouldn't say I'm potentially that, that well informed about everything because there's so much nuance and uh, there's so much going on. But I agree. And I think that, for myself, I've been to Asia, I've been to Thailand, I've lived in New Zealand as a backpack, all these things. I'm worried, if you're 21, you just came out of uni a year, two years ago, you've literally just come into the world where you can't go traveling, you can't go backpacking, yeah. you can't do all these things. And I'm thinking, hold on a second, we, we, we fucked up a bit here. And in, I love, in Papua New Guinea, uh, tribes have been observed as to how they go about life. And I love the fact that in tribes, when the elders get too old, they can't keep up with the tribe. The youngsters go from behind them and put an axe in the back of their head. But the elders don't flinch because when they were young, they used to have to do the axing themselves. And it's an appreciation. This is going to sound like genocidal to someone listening. There's an appreciation that sometimes your younger generations and mm -hmm. the speed they move at are more important than the older ones. And when COVID came along, like I was like, hallelujah. Like who, who's going down? People that have neglected their health and el older people. If it was a disease that just killed kids or just killed one gender or anything like that, we would imagine if it only I must admit, men. yeah, that would definitely have been worse. I know, okay, I know there's the, the, the more vulnerable in society, but say, take my parents, you know, my parents are 80. And yeah, again, all of a sudden, you know, they've not got that many years left. That's just a fact. To be locked in their house for the last year or two, potentially, of their lives, you know, they wanted to go out and do, they said, actually, we're going to die of something, so we'd rather go out. You know, don't don't lock us up. But yeah, you're right. If it was affecting the younger generation as well, I think it could have potentially been a lot worse. And, and again, well, at least like we've been exposed to it here, in a sense. Australia, I can't imagine what they're going to go through. As soon as they open like the borders, everyone there is living scared. I remember when I first went there and I did the quarantine. People were like, "So, do you know anyone that's had COVID?" I was like, "Yeah, Loads. everyone. Yeah, everyone." And they're so shocked by it. They're so scared that they're scared to come out of the bubble. So I can't imagine an 18 year old there ever going. I can't wait to go to Europe. Like, it's not going to happen for Oh, the a while. thought of it's kind of worse than the reality. Because I remember, like, you're just going to the supermarket here and go getting gloves on, mask on, not yeah. touching anything, Quite being really paranoid. Yeah, yeah. yeah get by, buying shit <laughs> yeah. loads of toilet paper because you never know how much you roll your knee. Again, you, you had a campaign to keep gyms open. Yeah. Where you arguably could say, hey, guys, this is what we're dealing with. You know, you know, we live in a democracy or we like to think that we do. And surely the public get to elect who runs the country, public get to vote on Brexit, public get to vote on all these things. Where the fuck was the public's vote when it was deciding what we do with our lives? Yeah, shagging. for the next 18 months. Shagging. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> they were yeah. shagging. Yeah. Yeah. Recording, Lou Roll. <laughs> everyone, was, everyone was fucking. Like still, everyone was still seeing their friends. Everyone was having secret house parties. The, the lockdown- If you're a Tory MP, you definitely were. That's yeah. what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but, but the fucked thing is like, you say to people, why not just say, hey guys, we're going to keep gyms open. We're going to close nightclubs for a bit. Yeah. Um, we're going to keep gyms open. But if you're going to go to the gym, don't fucking see your grandparents. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. But give people the choice, the opportunity. Because in essence, lockdowns didn't really stop the, the nature of humans interacting with each other. And yeah, I think at least give people the choice, you know, because like you say, for the economic impact of that, 
people complaining about our, you know, uh, hospitals and health workers. We get that and we appreciate that. And for that, it was fine. But when it becomes kind of semi-draconian in this point there on after where no one's taking into account statistics of mental health of people that are unemployed, people yeah, that are Yeah, cancer's going, on the rise yeah, and yeah. 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 Um, I don't want to say far more serious things, but yeah, I, I think unfortunately the true death toll we're not going to see for the next sort of few years in terms of mental health suicides and, and, and whatever but of course a very yeah, light note isn't it um right so we've touched on sex so um we've brought Darren in as well so Darren, you've got project sex um i think it's called um james you've got the james smith academy so james does Darren just copy everything you do but with a turkish accent basically salam alaikum my brother <laughs> uh, uh, no, nah, like uh, we, we both have our own things. And when Duran worked for me, he couldn't party as much because he was too busy working for me. So it's much better having his, him as a competitor. Was he a good employee? Yeah, he was very good. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, was no doubt the best coach the JSA have had. Uh, but having him as a competitor is way better because one, uh, as of maybe two months ago, he started buying dinners and uh, paying for his own flights, which is mad. Uh, so no, it's great having Darren on board. He makes more money than me some days. It's actually nice he's got his own money now. So he's got a bit of independence. To I stuff, like the so. way you two are swinging your small dicks around. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make you feel good about yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so now Darren, you've got the Darren Cartel show. So oh yeah, yeah, imaginative. Uh, see what we did there with the title. Um, James, you've got the James Smith podcast. Obviously, I've got Paul the Pin. Uh, what are your favourite podcasts? We're both going to say the same. What? I know what I'm going to say. What are you going to say? Joe Rogan. What, to listen to? Yeah. Or the episode? Oh. No, to look at. Oh, yeah. Joe Rogan, for sure. He's, he's, like, he's the best. He's the, he's he's the Don. for years. And I love his, um, his podcast that he does with people that no one knows about. Or like his friends. Or like some of the weird ones. You learn like, more sometimes listening to a podcast with him than... Like, and I, I listen to podcasts and I fall asleep. This is my thing. Like, I, I can't... I just love 15 minutes of just listening to conversations and I fall asleep. It's like almost Especially with Darren's, yeah, it'd be quite easy to do. <laughs> now, nah, me and Darren, we don't watch each other. You know what stories. I realise, Alan? <laughs> Go on. You really like me, don't you? That's it. You no. do. You do. <laughs> Any, you called in James just to get me here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, oh, oh, yeah. I, yeah. L literally invited, uh, yeah, James, just, just to get to you. Just just so you'd stay over, just so I can, I can sneak in tonight. What's your favourite podcast? What's your favourite podcast? Um, do you ooh. listen to any? I'm not as many now as I did because I used to drive. I used to listen to them on the commute to work, and now because we're not driving to the office, I don't have as much time, and it's not the sort of thing I'd sort of sit and listen to uh, at my desk. Like call her daddy or something. Uh, <laughs> I, well, funny to say, I quite like some of the military ones, so I quite like uh, some of the war stories ones because I like I like military stuff. Um, I quite like uh, James. Haskell and Chloe is mainly they've got uh, one called Couples Quarantine, which yeah. is just quite sort of entertaining as well. I'll be honest, I'm not just saying that you're here. I do like you, you guys as well. Uh, what else to listen Did to? You have to say that. Yeah, does Haskell get like an accelerator? Or does he, you pay him ten percent less every time that he mentioned you mention his podcast. Basically, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, we've got a long way to get, get him down to zero. Um, but yeah, not, so speak, not that much. <laughs> speak. Actually, speaking of. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, how's going to get him down to zero? Uh, blue tick. How the fuck do you get a blue tick? Because you've not got your blue tick yet, have you? I can't get one. I'd fuck a bloke. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. <laughs> well, you should, have, you, you should have four. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I um, I I like applied several times. I actually deleted my personal account because I was like, maybe that's why they're not giving it to me. Then we heard back uh, from one Instagram rep saying, you you got to stop fucking going after the big spending accounts because the people I was going after and like abusing were the ones that spent loads in advertising. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> their products were so shit they had to spend a lot of money. Um just to That's break not even. us by the way. And uh so yeah they said that but we applied, we applied, we applied and I was in Fiji with one of my JSA clients and do you know what? This is probably my nicest thing I've ever done. And Joy Duran I'll give Duran credit for this. When we're out and about, say we're in Bali, Duran will go sit with the locals and he'll be telling off a sixteen year old for smoking. He'll be like, how old are you? And the guy's like, what? He's like, how old are you? He's like 16. He snatches the cigarettes, goes, you shouldn't be smoking. Gives it to one of the older guys. Don't let him smoke. <laughs> and because we do that, now every time we're about, we get chatting to the locals, talking to people, having fun with them. And when I was in Fiji, we're doing this like, um, the zip wire things. And I see this guy and he's got a massive hole in his trainers. I was like, what size feet you got? And he's like, oh. I was like, what size feet you got? He told me and I gave him my trainers. I was like, I've got loads. I'm pretty sure we got sent them for free anyway. And I got in the minivan after I took a nap and I woke up and I had my blue tick. 
And I was like, maybe, maybe Who do I was... have to give a pair of fucking trainers? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Who'd want your trainers? Yeah. But I think it's also like a, a big press thing as well. It's when you get, when you, when you do a lot of press stuff like Smith, that year that you got it, you did a lot of stuff on the paper and stuff. I started like 310,000 followers when it came. Yeah. 310,000. But oh, okay. most of the people, the influencers that get it, especially ones that do a lot of ads and all that stuff, their managements have got good links with... I'm trying to say our management doesn't? No, well, no, because our manager's a good we, manager. We have met Luke. No, our manager's a good manager. <laughs> <Beep>. like, <laughs> but like, because they have those links, they can literally get them verified in a day as soon as they sign a contract with them. I think there's also an element of people like Darren and I quite disruptive in what we do. So it doesn't necessarily suit them to kind yeah. of encourage it. Yeah, because then uh, it gives us the ability to comment and go to the top of the algorithm. So like, even if I comment on a lad Bible, Unilad, uh, Joe Rogan, whatever, if I comment, I'm in the top 10 comments. And that's actually quite a lot of power because, um, you know, there was a guy on Unilad the other day who was a sperm donor. He would he'd park his van up outside people's houses. Wank put it into a syringe, put it under his armpit, go give it to strangers. He was living in Derby, right? I got lost down a rabbit hole watching this. I was like, can't wait to tell the lads, <laughs> like, you know, uni lad. And um, I comment on it. I said, ah, oh, if you need a sperm donor, sign an NDA, <laughs> eight out of tens and above, <laughs> no time wasters. <laughs> and suddenly people are screenshotting it and messaging me like, what the fuck? Like, and because people would have seen that, someone never followed me before, goes to Unilad, reads the comments about a guy wanking in a van. Like, Who's this prick with a blue tick offering <laughs> to bang birds, eight out of 10 and above? And it sees your video, maybe likes it and then follows and then it's, it's mad That's how, how we became friends make. with Example. So um, exa I comment on one of Example's posts, said to him like, this is sick when festivals all started coming back. He started following me and six months later when we got to Brisbane, he was like, wait, let's do a podcast. I said to him, how did you get onto me? And he goes, you commented on my post. Yeah, power of the tick. Again, it's back to kind of living on social media and... Kaneki Kanekis. Yeah. yeah, okay. So if there could be a film about your life, I'm looking at Dieran, but I'm talking to James. Um, if there could be a who would play you in the film? Do you want to go first? For James? Oh, no, I know, yeah, because I know who'd play Dieran. Go on. <laughs> well, I want to hear It's it. obvious. So, Sasha Baron Cohen would play <laughs> Dieran, wouldn't he? Wait, I'll take that. I will take that. He's a but as Borat. Hello, my <laughs> name is Dieran. I, 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 Don't I, cut this out, I, yeah? I, I, I have you lose weight. I'm going to use this against you. You want to do Project <laughs> Sexy Time? <laughs> That's actually pretty good. That is actually pretty good. Can, yeah, I, so say, that, can I say for James? Go on, then. I'm going to say what he's going to say first. Tom Hardy. See, yes. <laughs> How <laughs> fun. Tom Hardy. But I'll take, I'll take Charlie Hunnam. Who's that? The, oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, he oh. was in The Gentleman. I want to play a game, right? You know, he's oh, talking about okay. Guy. When you're older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I was going to say Tom Hardy. I was going to think. I don't know. I, don't know I used to have, have Tom Hardy teeth, you know. Yeah. Oh, what happened to those? Uh, got rich. <laughs> yes, so yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, yeah. no, like um yeah, I'd like a uh, crooked teeth. And when I worked in recruitment, I was like, no one's gonna no one's gonna fucking hire from me, are they? Coming in with a snaggle tooth. So I had to get them sorted. Uh, right, so we've established there definitely will not be a film about either well any of our lives, to be perfectly honest. Uh Death Row Meal, what would it be? I don't now, if if I'm going to I've said this, right? If I'm going death row, it's for something bad, right? Bad. Because if I'm getting death death sentence in the UK <laughs> It's got something to do with kids, murder, or something it, bad. Like, it's my, just the meal, really, but no, if you no, want to no, no, no. do it, explain the crime as well, carry had, on. My dad had to do 50 years. Not a lot of people know this. With my mum as a wife. And he never got to pick what he had for dinner for 50 years in marriage. Unbelievable. Right? So if my dad didn't get that right for 50 years, why should I get it on death row? You know what I mean? So, so like, mate, your crime was so heinous. We're not even going to lock you up for fucking murder. What do you want? Steak? Oh, yeah. Well, how do you, how'd you want it cooked? Why are we giving mass murdering genocidal paedophiles the right to have what they have? Is for that dinner? what you did? Is it? Oh, I'm saying that, that's the people on death row, isn't it? Imagine, and we're about to kill them. What a waste. What a waste. Keep the steak. Give it to someone else. All right. Give it to someone who deserves it. So, um, so the reason I'm laughing as well. So, you know, you said about the fact your mum and your dad 50 years, right? So my parents have been married for 50 years and lockdown was so bad for them this, they talked about getting divorced after no. 50 years of marriage. Yeah, because they couldn't stand to be in the house together any longer. They didn't have any of that time Yeah, away my dad had to come and stay with me for three weeks. No way. <laughs> they were getting divorced. I was like... How old are they? 
80. <laughs> That's amazing. But it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But 50 years, they've been fine. And then literally lockdown, oh, we just, because they were they couldn't go out. I was like, well, there's no point in getting divorced now. It's like, <laughs> what's it, the point? But anyway, so like just Smith. spitting on the house. I'm going to be really smart here. <clears throat> My last meal would be a grenade bar. Oh, God. <laughs> but the thing is as well, like, they, and there's some fucked up stuff. We'll cut that. We'll definitely cut that bit out. <laughs> some people um, say there was issues with Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand weren't letting people from Australia in without quarantine. Uh, because there was like trace amounts of cases and like there was families that had to travel and spend imagine two partners and a kid in a hotel room for two weeks like you would you only have the bathroom to get any separation from your wife and kids like you could be the happiest family in the world but you put them in two weeks that is not going to be good for getting married (laughs) yeah yeah saying that i don't know you guys are going to spare spend a night in that one room together we've done i think we Being him are so like socially aware of each other's space, we know when to like give each other space and not hence why we don't live together. But when we travel, we do so much together that we have fun when we're doing those things. You know what I mean? That sounded weird. Didn't it, it did sound a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah. But like, like for us, we, when our energy comes together, like, um, it, I don't know, we, it, we're just going to have more of a laugh in there together. And like, just, it, it, it feels so far removed because when we went to Bali initially, we were there for about three months, we were both skin and we're staying in a place that was 20 pound a night. Yeah. And um, we shared this Those room. Those places exist. It sounded like you said 20 pounds a night. Yeah. yeah. And it was nice. We had was, a, we opened our sliding doors. I'm, we had a swimming pool. I had a time pool. my life, I'm not going to lie. Really? Yeah, 100%. I actually, I reckon, I don't know if we'll ever have a time like that again because I think that was, it was that, it was that, you know that bit of growth? I don't know. I don't know what it was for you, but maybe before all this madness happened where- Maybe you are, I don't know, hungrier to achieve whatever you wanted to achieve or what it is. But before you got to the stage where you have a really nice car or a house like this, there's that phase that you probably really enjoyed and you can't wait to get to that. Do you know what I'm talking about? 100%, because you know what? That's the best phase is the journey, not the destination. I'm going to interject on this point as well, that when you had ascending success and financial uh, abilities to buy things, it curbs off after a while. Yeah. And for you, I'm pretty sure that the first time you bought a car new, sensible car would have felt the same as getting a ridiculous car now after there's diminishing returns and even to the point that say you stay in a five-star hotel in london you're like yeah it's it's nice but the first time you stayed in a five-star hotel you're like oh my god well just the first time you stayed in a hotel yeah yeah, yeah. not even a five star so actually the car point's a good one so i'd go further than that because i completely agree but actually not a question about i don't think it's a matter of having nicer cars or the first new car i just think the first car and you get in it, car, you're like, this is mine. Yeah, is the because previously I was on the bus or I was walking. Yeah. So the biggest change you'll ever make driving is not having a car to having a car, irrespective of whatever it is. After that, I think, yeah, Diminishing the better returns. car, the principle's still yeah. the same. So my first car was a Fiat Panda. It was the, yeah, the best car I ever had in terms of that freedom. And you have times in your life where you have unlimited disposable income, but I guarantee that first month of your life where you didn't have to check your bank account, you were like, and what we're getting at here is when we're in Bali staying in that room together, it was when we were first starting to stretch away from, because Duran and I spent years just doing session after session after session on the gym floor. So then transition into living in Bali and making a living from Bali, we'd oh. have to wake up every day and pinch ourselves. Yeah, because I, I was going from paying rent every week in a gym to physically have to be there every single day to having the freedom to, we were in Bali, then we were in Singapore, then we go back to Bali, we go to Dubai, and it was the best feeling ever, you know? Do you know what? And I think I call that hand-to-hand combat. You have to do the hand-to-hand combat to really appreciate it. Because I used to work in a gym. I, I worked in a gym on minimum wage for yeah. four years. Best time of my life. Yeah. 70 quid a week. Best time of my life. What Learn loads. What do you what do you think about all these? Because at the minute, online PT, online social media, it's all amazing, right? It's all good that everyone can now build a business online. But what do you feel about people that are going straight to online PT without having any experience of a business? Yeah, I just think I think you have to do the hands hand combat. Yeah, the thing I think with the generation now and social media, what I'm sort of against social media is I think it promotes instant gratification, yeah. and I think all of a sudden now people can just go, well, I'll just build a massive business overnight. so Or go on Love well, Island. Yeah, well, yeah. finish to say that, yeah, because that's that's obviously back yeah. on now. So are you a fan? It's like watching a car crash sometimes, isn't it? Like, like you drive past, it's, like, oh, it's tragic, and then you're looking. But yeah. that's it. Overnight, these people then are famous. Yeah. It, it's, it's dangerous because... And for the wrong reasons. Uh, yeah, and, and you know what? I think that everyone's got their own uh, reasons for doing it, and I've never... Some people do well out of it. I think some people don't, and... 
really, I think it's very important to have a slow trajectory of, you know, whether it's fame, recognition, finances, everything, to be a flash in the pan in your early 20s, I think is, it can't be great because you get that gratification, yeah. the money, the nightclubs want you in, bam, 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 bang. But then your relevance will decline. And no matter how savvy you are as a contestant, your following is going to be in the red for the next five, 10 years, no matter what. And I don't care what and people will say. play with here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll yeah, play yeah, with yeah. that, yeah. which is the worst, you know. Because what I said about market research as well, I lose following here and there and I don't care that much about it, but I do care about it because that is your market's perception of your brand yeah. in that real time. And even if you say, oh, you know, people just didn't want to see you. And also when your posts do really well, you lose the most followers because you pop up algorithmically so soon. People go, oh, fucking hell, not him again. Bomb, you're gone. But when you have that market research, sometimes Dylan and I, you know, when we're tipping the line of going too far, we're maybe doing too much of this, too much of that. But to see that going down every day. Yeah. And you, it's like when you're coming off steroids, like you're, you're, you're eating well, you're sleeping well, you're going to the gym, but you're still declining. Or just any decline. If you've been an athlete at the top of your game, if you've exactly. been a pop star that's that's yeah. just had a number one, it's all downhill from there. Yeah. That's why so, that slow growth is like yeah, yeah, so yeah. amazing. Like I'll get bantered about a blue tick all the time. I'm not fast, but if I- No, it doesn't sound like it, you're bothered about it. <laughs> to have it, it would be great. But then when you get it, it's like, oh, this feels special. Instead of just going on a TV show- Yeah, you show earn it. And getting everything at one go. Exactly, yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of- earning things yeah for definitely sure. and i think like i said you you know people now don't think i've got the patience or the time to earn something because they're think, soft and fucking lazy it drives me nuts sorry i'm really passionate about <laughs> yeah, it. And I, it it really drives me nuts when everyone like especially when like we we do get hate sometimes from like certain groups and people don't see like i've, I've been a pt for 10 years which groups which groups hate you oh uh, i mean other than just people be no, more just, specific. just just general haters i guess but they don't see the last 10 years or anything like that. Even like when I first started in the gym, like you said, I was clean. I remember cleaning the treadmill, but now you're getting people doing, oh, six months of PT, I'm online PT. And they expect things to happen like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then and they, they look, won't oh, clean. Exactly. Oh, cleaning's beneath me and everything's beneath exactly. them and, and stuff 100%. like that. I was knocking on doors selling gas and electric for NPower. It's like one of my favorite jobs looking back. I hated it at the time. Yeah. But like people go, you think it's hard being rejected on the gym floor. I was like, every door I was getting told to fuck off. And they'd be like, oh, come in. And they go, hold on, we use British gas. I'm like, exactly. And they'd be like, fuck off, get out of the house. Well, <laughs> like, you know, and then the, I worked in an office. I was saying to Duran the other day, like he, on the way here, we looked at an office. I went, look how depressing that is. I said, mate, I spent years in them. And in Bracknell, I was opposite an office that was empty for the whole year I sat in that space. So all day, every day, I just look at an empty office. And if someone came through with a ladder, I'd be like, Jamie, look, maintenance man. <laughs> That'd be the highlight of my day. And like, that's why you appreciate today, though, and what you're yeah. doing today, because you've gone through that stage, you know? The fact that you have to go for this, yeah, otherwise you don't appreciate it. That's why, again, if somebody so wins money or yeah. inherits money, the only way to make money, I think, is to make money. And yeah. lottery tickets, uh, I fucking hate them. I, I disagree with the entire principle. I, I guarantee you there's never been a single instance where someone's won the lottery where it hasn't created a lot more problems than it's actually solved. Yeah. I guarantee it. And people go, oh, but it's for charity. You know, like, if you care about charity that much, give to, why don't give you give charity. to the fucking yeah. charity without the 52 million going to the cunt from Newcastle? <laughs> yeah. I think that might be the first one, a pound. Um, right, so IFS, is it back on again now? International Fitness Summit. That's the, yeah. This year. This year. August. Now in London. Yes. yes. <laughs> Move location four times. It's gone from being in Portugal to being on a cruise ship to being in London. Yeah. Is it in a travel lodge? Uh, no. No, not at all. At great expense. Go on, tell us, tell us about it. Actually, who's going it? And am I still talking at it? In fact, I know I am because I've already been invited. Um, there's not a lot of uh, information to be confirmed just yet. But basically, Darren and I have played a big part in accumulating or choosing who attends. So we're the ones that kind of the visionaries of the attendees and like how it looks Slightly like. Slightly worrying. No, so when we see the lineup, we're like, well, he's a prick, met him. She's yeah. great. You know, like, so we do a bit of that. And then we're like, well, these two don't get on. Is no one going? No, 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 no. <laughs> but like, um, and for us, we've been to Body Power. We've been to the Fitness Expos. We've seen how shit they all are. And um, we've, I suppose, had an input into, you know. Creating a nice space for people to go and be like, you know what? Fitness is actually not as wanky as what they made it like other events, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. you know, where you don't have to be on juice or look, you don't have to be 4% body fat to actually go, you know, it, it welcomes everyone to being healthier, not just physically, but mentally as well. And also having speakers that align with that. Do you know, you know? I'm glad you've said that. Can I ask you both a question? Do you care how you look? Honestly? I care how I feel. 
Okay. So training the right and, that, and training and training. But do you care how you look though as well? Would you like to look better? I suppose you could make it happen if you wanted to. At times. And at the time we have conversations with each other where we're like in we budgies and we go, yeah, we go, yeah. we need to sort yeah. this out a bit. But then yeah. we both go, we do what we preach. We count the calories. We yeah. hit our steps and all of that. Um, do you know why I asked that? Because I don't. <laughs> People find that really hard to believe. But I used to really care how I looked. I'm sure lots of people do at some point. Is that when you had no money? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's exactly it, in fact. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly it. But no, I realised after this self-awareness we're talking about, when I looked my best, I felt my worst. And this is it. There's a big connection, I feel, between... If you, if you stop and disconnect your mind from your body for a second, you can get a good perception on how you feel. And often that correlation is fucking strong. And the obese models that are saying, I feel amazing, you're full of shit. You are full of shit. Like, you can say, I feel big, I feel confident, I feel all of this. I'm categorically telling you, that is just a mixture of failed attempts at dieting that have created a new persona. Yeah. And if they, if I, if I could sit down with these plus size beautiful models and say, look, here's an exoskeleton principle guideline I want you to try out. They lose some weight, they go fuck me, James. That that was excellent. I feel way better. I feel that. But you know now though, and I've spoken to a few of them after like all this body positivity madness. Um, they feel they actually get pressure from their audience now for trying to be healthier, which is a, even a crazier thing. Because yes, yeah, I'm really interested in health, and I don't think health's got anything really to do with how you look necessarily, depending on how you do how you do look. But for me, mine was less about being mental; it was more physical, just because I was training a lot. I got loads of injuries. Um, you know, my back was killing me. Uh, you go to the cinema, like oh, I can't see it for two hours. My back's killing me. You never get comfortable. Couldn't get comfortable driving. Um, you're always slightly hungry. You're always depriving yourself of what you really want to eat. You're kind of paying your dues as well with training. Where I find that when you train and perform well, and you you get two kilograms on your shoulder press, you get three extra reps on your tire flips, whatever it is, that pays into this kind of mental bank of how you're feeling. And for us, we we yesterday after a two hour session, we had three rounds of ten minutes sparring, like full on jujitsu, jitsu going for it. And even if you do feel a bit soft in the mirror, you're like, I was fucking spent Just, half an hour today fighting someone. Yeah. yeah. Someone from the Grace family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you, how, how old are you? Uh, I think I'm 44. 44. So do you feel like as you've gotten older, as you get older, do you care less about how you look? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I think so. Did yeah, you definitely. care when you were like 29, say my age? Um, did I at 29? Um yeah, I probably did at okay. 29, yeah. I would say. Yeah, I just think as you get a bit older, you just, I, th I think you just learn to categorise things. I feel in like terms that's of, happening for me, that's yeah, what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> I think you just, yeah, and it is all about balance. If you want, yeah, go and eat something, go and eat something. You can't do it all the time. If, you know, like you said, you, I don't really count calories, but I know what's good for me, what's bad for me. Yeah. Back to your point about IFS, and I think that one thing we managed to do is, is cultivate a group of people with similar values. And the way we construct and put out our social media is very much you're either with our values or you're not mm -hmm. and the reason we're polarizing is that if someone's not right for our crowd they will not want to stay around they'll be like this guy's rude he uses too many swear words so when we bring together hundreds and hopefully thousands of people together at an event they're all very much similar when it comes mm -hmm. to values and i think that they drink they have fun they want to party which is why the parties are always mad at the ifs events but also they all want the same thing from fitness which is very similar to what you guys have just mm -hmm. been talking about and ultimately, if we look at like the, our favorite parts of our week, our training's there, but also the meals where you're having steak and wine and, you know, you're doing that <laughs> thing with the wine and the steak and stuff like that. How's it going? <laughs> like, but when, when you're so focused and extremist with like diet and all of these kind of things and how you look, you deprive yourself from you're these other things that you like. I, I think it's a distraction for most bodybuilders that I've seen. I think working on their physique so much is actually a distraction from their real problems. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. So, and I yeah. think a lot of people do that to put that energy there instead of actually dealing with their vulnerability. Well, for me as well, I always wanted to be strong. So I, I, I'd always felt, I, I used to do a lot of really sort of old school weight training, especially like 30 years ago. And again, it was like quite a hardcore gym. And for me, it was about, you know, benching the most, squatting the most, shoulder pressing the most. And I'd set myself all these targets. So yeah. it didn't really matter how it looked. I wanted to hit those strength targets because again, that was an indication that you were sort of going the right way. And then I sort of hit all those targets. It was like, oh, actually, I actually don't know what to do now because <laughs> everything I set out to do, I did. Yeah. And then it's a bit like, oh, actually, what now? Yeah. And that's why performance goals are so important because I never forget reading a story about, I think it was Marilyn Manson at 27 found himself crying into a massive pile of cocaine because he's completed everything he wanted to in life at 27. And he was fucked because he, he had all these big ambitions. I know he's a, a nutter, but it was a powerful story. 
And if you set your goals in the wrong place, you'll either never achieve them or get close, or you'll achieve them too early. Yeah, and then you what then? And with physique comp, you get down to three percent. Take a look at steroids, tense on stage with fake tan. Then oh, what? Yeah. Then yeah. What? It happened and, to Fury as well, isn't it? Yeah, and Fury again, heavyweight champion of the world. Boom. So with performance goals, like for us, if we get our black belt in the next five, ten years, that's only really the beginning of your journey as a as a practitioner of the sport. For jiu-jitsu, you've got a 10-year buy-in. Once you get your black belt, you now have the ability to teach people and compete against black belts that are better than you. Do you know the nice thing? I think they're probably about something like a martial art. Now, I'm into flying because it's something that you can always get better at. Yeah. You can fly for 60 years and you can still get better. You yeah. can learn. We can fly yeah. different things. I guess it's the same for martial arts. There's always someone who can beat the shit out of you. Yeah. So you always want to keep learning and getting better and better and better. I think with the physique goals, to a certain extent, I think they're a bit finite. Like you see, the body yeah. fat, you're down to that 3%. Oh, actually, I can't get any leaner. I can't really get any bigger. And it's only going to get worse as you get older. Yeah, well, I like that's why I like working on a brand and working on the business because there's always room for improvement. And actually then, you can just set your sights on stuff that you can develop because a brand is never done. Your business will never be done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think your physique, it's a bit kind of, that's it now. And, and even for martial arts, as you get older, you just have to develop your own style of competing. If you've got a bad back, then don't put yourself in positions where you get stuck. Exactly, yeah. If you've that's got bad shoulders, true. then don't get kamurid. Like there's there's all these little like pathways you can go. And, and to sit back and for us, being recognised as being good at what we do, that's cool. But we spent 12 hours last week training where we're not even near the top of our game. And people say, you, you stay quite well grounded. We're like, yeah, because we we get our asses beaten up literally yeah, every day. Every day. And it's every such day. a great physical reminder to, you know, take that into, into life, into every aspect. Like with your business, some people have such a single dimension existence where they're like big dick of their fucking brokership or insurance broker in London. They get way ahead of themselves. They get like fancy stuff and they're like, oh, I'm fucking big dick. I, I don't want to do for you guys. It's just occurred to me. I'm going to set you up with a friend of mine who is head of combat for the British Army. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's got a place in in London, and he'll probably Richmond. So, is it in Richmond? Uh, I just know it's in London. Okay, I think I Sam, know Sam Sheriff. The, you know what I told you about the military guys that yeah. train with? They're linked to the Grace. Yeah, yeah. I know. yeah I'll, set, can, I'll, set, I'll set you'd enjoy that. I'll set you. Up if with you that, send so. that to Luke in my bio, we'll <laughs> we'll negotiate a fee for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just 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 being kind, really. But look, we're, we're running out of time. But I've just I want to get some questions on social, so I'm going to go straight to the most popular question. Without shadow of a doubt, we've we've been asked. It's really it's one it's one for, for James, but Darren, you're very welcome to comment as well. So, um, why hasn't that legend Al? I didn't write this. Um, been on the James Smith podcast. Let's face it, he's supplement royalty. Not my words. This is the reader's words. Um, even Darren has been on there, and he's just a bell end. <laughs> and who wrote that? Oh, uh, it just, just uh, a, 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 a non. Yeah, yeah a non. Yeah, yeah. We've had that a lot. So, like when we decide uh, who comes on the podcast, we like something to be like mutually beneficial me coming on here today will do wonders for your downloads and we're just not sure if the other is really going to quite work out so well love it just hit me with but, it i can take it but, be honest but there's other ways you can make up for that yeah such as luke in bio <laughs> <laughs> on that note fuck the barrier yeah. uh guys thank you i mean Darren, we've done 27 podcasts but james really enjoyed that thanks Cheers, so thank much for much. coming on it's been it's been great listening to you and again one of the most controversial figures um, in the fitness industry, but for the right reasons as well. Thank and you. actually, joking aside, we say this a lot, but I love the fact that you guys are just yourselves and you are out there actually getting great information out, but in your own way, that's understandable and digestible. And I think it's fantastic what you do for the fitness industry. And I love the fact that you call people out and, and whatever as well. So, no, superb, been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Huh? Guys, yeah. thanks for watching and listening. This is Alan Barrett on Pull the Pin. And today we had James Smith and a little bit of, of Deer and Cartel as well, again, for the 27th time. But please like, subscribe and download, both of you. Hopefully, James's comments, we can <laughs> we can start to get this becoming a bit more popular than it actually is because we know no one listens to this. Uh, but no, thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time. 